Okay, so yeah, following on from the last session where Rakesh was talking about a healthy ethical diet for the planet, I want to speak a little bit more about the ecosystem inside. So thinking a little bit about what is the human microbiome, um, how is fermentation working as its own kind of ecosystem, and how is that healthy for our microbiome? Why do the two things go together and complement each other? So yeah, like in general, when we speak about the, the human microbiome, um, when it's in balance, yeah, it's really like a kind of ecosystem inside our body. So kind of the microbiome like a term, what it means is it's the genetic material of all the microbes. So the bacteria, fungi, protozoa that live either on or inside our body. Um, and actually when it's been researched, like the, the genetic material, so like all the genes from the microbes in our microbiome is about 200 times the number of genes in the human genome. So you can see that like, even something that we kind of feel that's not part of our body. It has such a big role in our physical body and such a huge amount of diversity. So it's really kind of like worlds within worlds. Um, and one of the things that kind of helps me to think about it, I often, when I'm thinking about kind of uh, working with the land, I kind of think back to the, my body. And when I'm thinking about my body, I think to the land. So I kind of feel about the kind of um, microbiome and the digestive tract um, as the kind of soil of the body. Um, so if you think about like a healthy soil, um, the idea there is that we want to have like a big diversity. We want to have a lot of different life forms. Obviously in our digestive system, we want to have more like microbes and less worms, unlike the soil. If we're having too many worms, that's not gonna be so healthy. Um, but also, you know, if we're thinking about the soil, one of the big maxims is, um, you know, we're not feeding the plants, we're feeding, fe feeding the soil life, which will feed the plants. Um, and it's kind of similar with our digestive system. So, you know, when we're um, consuming food, we're not actually like directly consuming the food, which is then like nourishing our body, we're actually feeding um, the different microbes in the digestive system, which are breaking it down and making it available to the different uh, bodily processes that we need to run our body to regenerate and to be healthy. Um, and so, yeah, like if you kind of continue with this analogy, um, for fermented foods have a really important part to play. Um, so as Rakesh said before, they're pre-digesting our food and then they're adding even more local diversity to our microbiome. So like one of the amazing things when we're doing like a wild fermentation, so that's any fermentation where we're allowing the local microbes to influence the process rather than like using a starter, which you might use for making like miso or any of these kind of like more popular milk products. Um, so when we're using that kind of local um, uh, microbial diversity, we're really um, kind of grounding ourselves in this place and we're kind of adding more and more and more diversity to our body. So in this way, if the kind of the, the digestive system is the soil, what we're doing is we're adding something like a compost or a plant slurry, you know, where we're fermenting plants, we're kind of adding like this really individual, always changing kind of diversity to our body. Um, and on a nutritional kind of, from a nutritional perspective, it's gonna be much more effective than adding these kind of elements in some kind of predefined kind of regimented form, which you might get from having like chemical vitamins or minerals. So like having your vitamin tablets, which says, okay, I'm getting this much vitamin B, this much vitamin C. Um, but these kind of, you know, or fortified food, you can get like flour from the shop that's been fortified with B vitamins, soya milk in a packet that's being fortified with B vitamins. Um, but they're kind of, you know, like the MPK fertilizer of food, you know, 
rather than adding a nutritious uh, compost to our soil we're adding this like kind of chemical elements because we say like this we can be sure that we're having so much nitrogen and so much potassium and so much phosphates and the same with you know the vitamin tablets like Rakesh said once you start to like commodify all this food you know you turn it into a product and you can sell it um but actually, if you think how empowering is it that we can make that ourselves? you know, we can take simple vegetables, maybe even ones that weren't particularly amazing, you know, if we have them grown fresh from our garden or harvested um, from the wild, it's amazing, but you can also take like quite an average cabbage and it becomes completely transformed as it goes through the fermentation process. So even though it's kind of unknown, um, I think that's one of the amazing things about thinking about the microbiome and the fermenting process is that there's, you know, an element of kind of trust in that, that we, you know, the more diversity you have, you're going to kind of cover all these things. And the more diversity you have in the microbiome, the more stability you're going to have in your system at large. Um, so, yeah, I've been reading different things about this recently. Um, and yeah, it's actually, it's a, it's a really amazing kind of world that you kind of jump into. So, you know, each of us has a very individual microbiome. There was research and they found even identical twins who share like 99.5% of their genes only share about 20% of their gut microbiome. So you know, even though they're probably eating the same or similar foods as they grow up and they have that genetic uh, stability somewhere, they've got this like very different uh, gut microbiome and that's in identical twins. Um, so yeah, like if two people were eating like the same foods um, and, but they have like uh, different changes in their microbiome, um, it shows that, yeah, like it's a very, very personal thing. So you've even got people like living in the same way, eating the same things, maybe even with the same genetics. And yet they can react very differently to things that are happening just because that ecosystem inside them is so personal. Um, and as I said before, yeah, it's a really big part of our body. So if you took all the bacteria and the other microbes that we have inside our whole body, um, it would weigh about two kilograms. Um, so yeah, this kind of idea of the, this kind of the self, like this is me and these other things are not me, starts to really break down. Um, so that kind of wall of like, you know, this is where I stop and this is where like something other begins, that really becomes like a lot more uh, fluid because all these uh, uh, microbes are coming in our body, are coming out of our body and there's a really big exchange. So here I'm kind of focusing a bit more on the digestive tract, but that in itself is very long. So it's like starting at our lips, it's going all the way through our mouth, through our intestines and coming out our rectum. But then, you know, we also have another uh, microbiome on the surface of the skin that's also interacting with that. We have it in the vaginal tract. So that's important when children are born, that they're also like getting... Um, uh, kind of inoculated with all these microbes and then we also have in the brain as well we have a different microbiome that interacts with the one of our digestive system um, so I think I've got about five minutes um, yeah it's a really big topic actually I have a lot of things I wanted to share but let's see how many of them we'll get through today. Um, so yeah, as we talked about before, you know, the, the microbiome is really connected to other things. So it's not just about our digestive. We've also like, it has an effect on our mental health. So when there's a, like a disbalance in that, it's also affecting our mental health. It's affecting our heart health and it's uh, interacting with our um, immune system. So, for example, about, I think, 70% of our immune cells um, are in our gut. Um, and what the microbiome is doing is actually educating the immune system. So the immune system learns by experience. It does something and then it checks the feedback 
and then it does something else and it checks the feedback. So the kind of the gut is having this kind of conversation with the immune system. Uh, the immune system is like reacting to things that are going on, like kind of different populations of bacteria, how they're working when the bacteria can go out of the of the gut. For example, if you have like a leaky gut, the immune system will start to find bacteria in other places in the body and it will start to like attack it. So there's this kind of yeah constant conversation uh, and feedback loop happening between what's going on in the gut and what's going on with the immune system. Um, and I think also it's a really important thing to think about at the moment. So this kind of idea of dysbiosis, you know, so this is the idea of like a disbalance, which is we already looked about, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of problems where we're actually disrupting this ecosystem. So that could be due to medicine. I think everyone's already familiar with antibiotics. So you've got, yeah, this is like against the biotic, against the, the balance that's happening inside. Um, and that can also be, you know, in the food that we're consuming. It's another reason why when we're consuming animal products, it's very problematic, aside from the direct ethical treatment of the animals, is that they're also being poisoned. And then from consuming them, we're also taking in those things, including antibiotics and artificial hormones. Um, and then, yeah, there's a whole kind of range of chemicals that are in our food and all of those things are killing our gut bacteria. And so what they're doing is, as you're breaking that down, you're ending up killing a lot of these friendly bacteria. And then you have a proliferation of these kind of stronger, unfriendly bacteria, which are often pathogenic. And then they start to take over your body. So a lot of people, you know, talk about like, oh, I've got candida and it's a big problem. Well, most people will have candida in their gut, but it will be in balance with other bacteria that will keep it in check. So it's a bit like having a meeting, you know, you have like uh, everyone kind of sharing uh, ideas, but then you've got that one person who wants to answer all the questions and is shouting over everyone. And, you know, one by one, people get fed up and they leave the meeting until finally you've just got like this opinionated person shouting. Um, so it's a bit like that you kind of want to support that balance of having like many voices and many kind of different bacterial um, and microbial um, clans kind of living together. Um, so yeah, let's see, I've got a lot of things, but maybe I'm going to speak about some of them another time. Um, but yeah, maybe just to kind of uh, recap on some of the things that Rakesh touched on. Um, so like if we're looking at fermentation, this is like the kind of pre-digestion of the food. So it's another kind of ecosystem that you're creating um, where you're already creating this kind of life and this diversity that's coming in connection to the ecosystem around you. And then you're putting this in your body, which is supporting, it's adding diversity to the ecosystem inside of you. Um, and what it's also doing, though, is it's kind of working directly with some of the substances um, in the food and making them bioavailable. So as we said before, you know, like, rather than just kind of going through the body, like allowing these things really to to be taken up. So the bacteria are having that kind of intermediary role. Um, so like, yeah, there are really a lot of examples. Like if we think about products like soya, for example, it's something that was traditionally only used fermented and used in small amounts. So in itself, it's quite a complex protein, um, but through the fermentation, it's broken down into easily digestible amino acids. Um, grains are another food that are quite difficult for people to digest. And again, once they're fermented, they have like, often about twice as much starch digestibility. Um, and also with sugars, they're often much more easier to digest when they're broken down. And again, like lactose and other things that I'm not gonna go into here, but yeah, they're also broken down in certain ways in the fermentation process. Um, and also foods that can be kind of toxic. So there are things that have like cyanide in them, like the phytic acid in, in grains, um, 
you've got things that have like nitrates or oxalic acid and a lot of greens, all of those which can be quite difficult for the body, um, actually are broken down and become very safe and nutritious in the um, process of the fermentation. Um, and also, yeah, there's some really interesting examples actually of how they've actually found direct examples of um, fermentation dealing with pathogenic um, microbes and healing different um, health problems. So for example, uh, lactobacilli, they can inhibit the growth of the diarrhea related bacteria like um, Shigella, Salmonella and E. coli. Um, and what they do is they compete with the pathogens for places on the cell surfaces. So they're kind of like proliferating and kind of pushing them off the cell surface. Um, they also found in Korea the avian flu where they um, treated animals that had this, uh, birds with the avian flu by giving them kimchi. And they also found another famous example in Japan after they had the problems with the radiation poisoning that people who consumed miso in the form of soup, it was actually binding with the heavy metals and um, cleaning them through the body. Um, and maybe, yeah, just the last thing before I finish in kind of relation of that kind of cleaning the body. Um, one interesting thing about fermented food, it's often a reason why people say they don't want to consume it. So like, I don't know, has anyone had any bad effects after consuming um, fermented food, like bloating or gas? and thought like, oh, there's something wrong with this food. Rakesh is shaking his head, but that's probably because you've got a clean body. Um, what sometimes happens is people who've had quite a bad diet, they become kind of enlightened for whatever reason. And they're like, okay, now I'm gonna start with some fermented foods because they're really healthy. And they start eating them. And then they're like, oh, I've got really bad bloating, gas, like this food's really bad, it's not for me. Um, and actually what that could be a sign of um, is that actually it's working really well. What could be that you've got like a big buildup of pathogenic like bacteria and fungi in the gut. And actually what the uh, fermented food is doing and what the good bacteria inside are doing are actually killing them off. So for example, like they can contain like antimicrobial peptides, which are killing these pathogens like Salmonella and E. coli. Um, and as they're kind of going through your body and breaking down, that's causing the, the gas and the bloating. Um, so it's a bit like, you know, if you're fasting or cleansing your body, if you take it too fast and you have a big toxic load, it can be really intense. But if you start with smaller doses of the fermented food, it can give your body a chance to, to clean it out. So that's probably all I've got time for for now. Maybe in another session, we can speak a bit more about, yeah, some of the things that are happening in the fermented process itself, because that's also really interesting, the kind of succession of different colonies and how they're changing that and how that kind of process works. Um, but for now, yeah, I, I think that's all. Are there any questions? One interesting thing for me you were saying is how um, fermenting foods can, for example, um, nullify, I can't remember the exact term you use, uh, things like cyanide and you know, la um, oxalic acids and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Because as, as you may know, I, I ferment young cherries, so unripe cherries. And everyone, you know, anyone who's done a health and safety, food health and safety, course we'll know that cherry seeds contain cyanide and you must be careful because one person may have died uh in the last you know thousand years because of eating it um so you must be careful um and you know there, there's no i've no i don't know how many i've eaten but i've never felt had one which is bitter and you know bitter is if you taste it and it's bitter then you know there's cyanide in there that's that's what makes it bitter I've never, ever, ever had that. So um, I'm wondering whether it's because the cyanide hasn't had time to actually develop or whether it's just because of the fermentation process. 
Um, but it's interesting that you say that it can actually nullify it or I can't remember the term you used though. Yeah, something like it kind of breaks it down that there's something in the fermented food, which is, yeah, like breaking down those substances and kind of, yeah, making them something innocuous in the end. But yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, with the cyanide in the, in the cherries. I know like from preserving cherries, most people say, like because in Bulgaria, for example, pe this is not fermented, but people have like um, compote. So you have like fruit that's in like uh, water um, and you can do it with cherries and the stones, but they said you should consume it within a year and kind of after a year, there can be a problem with the cyanide. Um, so yeah, part of it might be to do with the timing and it might also be to do with the fermentation. I think, I think it's an interesting thing to look up because one of the things that you like, you know, if we think about resilience and food systems, there are all these kind of traditional food, which are like kind of famine foods, you know, things that we don't usually eat because they're a bit toxic, but that grow really, really well and can provide potentially kind of nutrition in difficult situations, like in um, when you've got like, I don't know, like a big drought or something. But if you combine that with um, fermentation, these like, kind of famine foods that could be toxic can become really nutritious. <laughs> uh, Steve's got his cherries there. Are they trezhnia. fermented cherries or are they in a compote, Steve? Vishnia or Trezhnia? You call it <laughs> Cherry compote. Ah, okay. Very nice. So, Laura was asking if there was a book that you can advise on that has some of this information in. Okay. Yeah, I've just put it in the chat. A book I really like is uh, Wild Fermentation by Sandor Katz. Uh, and that goes back to what we were talking about, also about the kind of pattern understanding. Um, so he has a lot about what's going on inside your body and about that connection to your environment using the wild fermentation and also has recipes from around the world. But mainly he's kind of looking at different kind of techniques that then you can experiment with. And I think it's really nice because a lot of the things you can find online, especially American, are like with a lot of fear, like you need to do it exactly like this and you need to buy this expensive equipment and just like throw it out if like you get something, anything on the top or anything is wrong. You know, there's like so much kind of fear and commercialism around it. And even though he's also American, he's quite like kind of carefree and joyful about it. He's like, you know, experiment. And obviously, like Rakesh said, if there's like a red or a blue or a black mold on it, or it looks really horrible and disgusting, like throw it away. Um, but if it's kind of funky um, and it feels OK for your body, then try it, you know. Um, and yeah, like, you know, the salt, you can experiment with the layer of the level of salt. You can experiment with what vegetables, what things you combine and. And I think it's like a fun, creative process, not something we need to be like measuring everything and be really stressed about. Okay. Well, I'm just off to eat my supper now. Um, so I'm going to say goodbye. It's um, fermented cabbage, torsia, um, and homemade chili pickle. So it's been lovely to see you this evening, see all of you this evening. And for, the, for the Bulgarians here, um, actually, I think Sophie, you're the only one. Um, <laughs> the VS Lacko. Homemade chili sauce. Delicious. Actually, it's a Jamie Oliver recipe. It's very good. It's got apple in it. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, it's beautiful. Um, for the Bulgarians here, the, the uh, karaoke session is the 11th of December. That's our next. I think that's a Saturday night, the 11th of December. And um, so let us know if you want to come. And obviously, Rakesh, it's a bit far to pop over from London, I think, isn't it? But um, you can be the travel with miles for a good karaoke, let me tell you. Uh, I'll actually be in Ireland. Actually, well, in a permaculture design course there. Anyway, yeah. so oh, even further away. You're in Ireland? Ireland, right. yeah, for the first time ever. Well, um, you know, we, we heard a lot about uh, developing resilience in our mental health uh, capacity, and, you know, for our mental health. And um, for me, as a you know, I've been a musician and a music teacher all my life. So uh, music pays a, plays an, an important part in that. And, uh, you know, and other people find it's great fun and, and, and I always feel better after it. So if, if you're in the area, come along, join us. 
and uh, a good time will be had by all. And I promise you some of Vanya's amazing torsio if you come. <laughs> <laughs> and sour cabbage, yes, she said. Thanks in the for the invitation. Too. Okay, all the best, everybody. Take care. Bye bye. Stop the recording. Or yeah, let's stop. And then start um, again when you start the. the next